Welcome back everyone. I would like to call upon Dr. P. Venkateshwar Rao to introduce our guest of honor. Good morning everybody. So I am here to introduce Professor Mahindra Kumar Madhavan. He is a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. He has obtained a PhD and MBA in Finance from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and his master's degree from the National University of Singapore. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of Alabama, USA, prior to IIT Hyderabad. He worked as a structural engineer at Alabama Power Company, Birmingham, USA. Professor Madhavan is an international expert in structural steel, cold form steel, and steel concrete composite construction and has published more than 50 peer-reviewed internationally reputed journals and holds membership in the American Society of Civil Engineers, Structural Engineering Institute, Technical Administrative Committee on Metals and in ASEA Cold Formed Steel Members Committee. Professor Madhavan has significantly contributed to the revision of IS-801 Indian Design Code for Cold Formed Steel Members based on the original research work carried out at IIT Hyderabad to fulfill the Government of India's goal of housing for all through sustainable construction. He is an editorial board member of the Journal of Structures and is an associate editor of the ASC Journal of Structural Engineering and serves as a reviewer for more than 10 international journals. Professor Madhavan is a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, fellow of the Institution of Engineers, London. He is also the first Indian to be elected as a fellow of ASC Structural Engineering Institute. Thank you, sir, for coming here. Thank you, sir, for coming here. Thank you, sir, for coming here. I kindly request our guest of honor to take over the session. sections, eye sections, and then you have plates, channels, angles that you see uh, typically in an industrial building is a hot old steel. What you see on the right side is a cold form steel. Cold form steel does not have a definite shape. Okay, it's thin. It's uh, working parameters ranges from say uh, 1 mm to 3 mm. So less than 1 mm is non-structural, but more than 1 mm is structural. So 1 mm to 3 mm is kind of the working range for a cold form steel. Cold form steel, you are the captain of your own ship. There is no specific, say, per se, for example, a specific shape. You can make your shape that you want. As long as it satisfies the stiffness and the strength purposes, there is no shape. Whereas in hot old steel, what happens is that in hot old steel, you come across IS-808. You know what is IS-808? IS-808 basically is a, a design document. IS-800 is a steel document. IS-808 gives you the dimensions of the steel properties, okay? It's very easy now. You can Google IS-808 and get it for free. 
When I used to be an undergraduate student at College of Engineering, Gindi, there used to be a BIS office in Taramani. Okay? And it's very difficult to get a code book. You, uh, you know, all the 34 students there have to go and sit in front of the HOD's office for two days and then you finally agree to give a letter. You have to take that letter and go to the BIS office and then they'll say that the stock is not there. You ask when the stock, by the time you get it, the semester would be over. Okay, so that difficult it is, but now you can type everything you get it in Google free of cost. Okay, so that section gives you specific properties here. Okay, so it has a specified depth, it has a specified width, it has a specific thickness, moment of finisher, radius of gyration, root radius, tow radius, everything that you need to know is given in IS808 for hot mode steel, which means that it is a very well defined product off the shelf. You can order it, you can get it. Unlike cold form steel, you can make your own shape. Okay, it can be made from different processes, but you can make your own shape as long as you satisfy the strength and stiffness. Okay. So, another difference between hot rod steel and cold form steel is hot rod steel is a very, very uh, cost intensive uh, uh, production, which means that a hot rod steel industry typically needs 10,000 crores for it to establish. Jindal steel, Tata steel, or Jindal Steel, you know, works and uh, you know, Jindal Steel and uh, Power Plant, uh, Steel and Power Limited. They will have huge amounts of investment, Vizag Steel for example, these are 10,000 crores to invest, it is called an integrated steel manufacturing unit. Whereas coal form steel is just a piece of sheet, you can get it, you buy some press break machine for 5 lakh rupees or 10 lakh rupees, you can get it and you can uh, produce your own cross sections and shapes. Okay. One another important thing about hot rod steel and cold form steel is that hot rod steels are not prone to local buckling and cold form steels uh, are prone to local buckling. Anybody know what is a local buckling? Have studied uh, <coughs> local buckling? Have you not studied in your uh, are you third year, second year, first year? What kind of students are you? Huh? Huh? All combined. Okay, so if you are in third year and if you have studied, say, Steel design, for example, absolutely your instructor should have given you some indication of what the uh, local buckling is. Buckling that happens locally is called local buckling. Karana Okay. So, so what you see on the left side side is the big structure. See the connections and other things. This is rigid. This is a hot rod steel. Cold form steel is very thin. Okay. This is uh, this is me standing here. So this is a construction site of that uh, hydro bag. So this is used for residential construction. And another thing is hot rod steel members typically have thicker uh, bolts and other things. Okay, you have to weld it here. It is smaller ones and then the screws are small. Typically, uh, screws are being used in cold form steel. And you should also have nuts which is less than 12 mm. Here the nuts and bolt sizes will be more than 12 mm. Here you use pop rivets. So these are the different types of connections in uh, Cold form steel versus hot rod steel. So that gives you a different indication. What does it look like? This looks like a concrete building, right? This looks like a concrete building, but it is 100% cold form steel. Except the foundation, everything is. Okay, so how do I say that? Because I was part of this uh, building construction. So this is how the building was done. So this is a hot rod steel. This is basically your uh, construction site. Before you saw that, so concrete is poured. And then you have the steel structures, and then you have again, you know, the first floor is being done, then you put the sheathing boards, the second floor is being done, and finally it gets constructed. So the outer sheet board is called the particle cement board, basically that is used by the screws that is being put into this place, right? So uh, I took my students, uh, third year undergraduate students, so that they can see that this was uh, prior to COVID, so I could take them. And they were very all happy about that. Some of them are in other countries now studying PhD and other things. The purpose of showing this is that people think that cold form steel will not take load, but you put concentrated load on one side of the structure, it still doesn't fail, you know. It still can take a lot more load here. The beauty of cold form steel is that you don't need heavy equipment, heavy machinery, nothing. All you need is a press brake, you can even manufacture the site. And two people can lift the beams in the columns and put it in place and you screw it. The entire construction can be done in two weeks or less than that as long as the foundation is ready. 
so that helps us to build say for example safer houses during tsunami and things like that we can quickly build construction or for people who are coming from other states to work here temporary basis they can be put in a housing situation like this and this can be a nice villa for people in the southern you know in the coastal areas if you want a nice villa this can be easily constructed so coal from steel has a lot more benefits associated with that okay but most of the problem is that it can be done using bending of a roll flat sheet at room temperature but it is lightweight ease of construction cost effective one of the major thing is it's over designed why is it over designed see when you know something okay and you do something it's called factor of safety right but if you don't know anything what do you do it's called factor of ignorance in sub 2 you put that so when you go and work for an engineering organization okay your boss is more powerful than your god right so you you cannot say no to your boss your boss will say do it you will do it but you multiply by 3 or 4 because you don't know why we don't know because ignorance why ignorance because lack of scientific data why lack of scientific data because we have not done enough research right so that's the root cause for everything is ignorance and the ignorance comes because we don't have scientific data for us to have a better understanding so what do we do if you don't know anything you multiply by 3 or 4 and then you put it right here it is over designed this is not a coal farm steel house it looks like a coal farm steel cage right okay so that is because of lack of design specification the current design specifications that we have currently in india uh, india does not have one the one that the one they have a guarantee is before i was born so it was more than 45 years old so we are right now trying to modify that okay so lack of design specifications is one of the major reasons for us to do why because as a structural engineer i need to have a safe house what if a structure fails how do i defend myself i will defend myself in a court of law by saying that i follow the indian standard or the design practice that is being adopted by the government of india who are it right that is my safe house if the design document is there is no design document then how do you go forward defending yourself so it becomes an ethical question for a structural engineer to stick a snake out and to do something without having any backup for him right so the backup for you the the kavash the shield for you as a structural engineer is your design specifications if the design specifications is lacking then you are basically exposed so that is why it is important for any nation or any government for the progress path to progress is to have a design document you look at any developed nation us uk or any developed nation the design documents will be this thick they don't hide information they give it to you they want the citizens to be empowered educated the one that questions the government so that they progress and improve if you look at our is 800 what it has it has equations and equations and equations okay without telling where they got the equations if you look at any developed specification the left side there will be equations the right side there will be commentary commentary is basically code or tamil notes right it will tell you exactly where they got this how they got this who did it If you want to know more information, please follow this this document. That also is available in Google, right? So they are empowering empowering you to care. Here, what happens when we write a code? What do we do here? You know, there is the famous uh, Janagra joke, right? Uh, he goes to the sweet shop. He takes you know one kilo of this, one kilo of that, one kilo of that, and finally mix it together. Give me fifty grams of that, right? So that is how our design document is. Some are stolen from Australian code. Some are stolen from American code. Some are stolen. and to add uh, you know not as worse they will not tell where they stole it from because that is becoming a trade secret a design document cannot be a secret a design document has to be something a reasonable engineer should be able to understand and to improve himself the logical the reasoning behind that so that is also a key thing that we need to take into consideration when we write so this document that i have been working with the is 801 coding committee they want to told that we need to have a commentary so whenever we wrote something we also gave the commentary with it but what they have said is that first we will publish this one we have the commentary with you the next one will be a set of commentary that will come so before we go into that the coal farm steel has seven things wall panels okay beams built up beams columns built up columns flooring systems connections welded connections bolted connections 
Okay, all these things are needed for a poor form steel housing system, which some parts of it I am working on things with my students. Okay, but here I am going to talk about only one thing, which is poor form steel wall panels. Okay, so unlike the previous lecture, which will be little not tutorial based, it will be sort of tutorial, sort of is you know. Okay, I need one help from you, undivided attention for the next about ten minutes. You know what an undivided attention is? Physically as well as mentally present. Right? Okay. Thank you. So when we look at pole form steel wall panels, what do we do? We put some studs here. Okay. Then we put something called bridging or blocking. Okay. And then on the top you see a crack, and the bottom also. Now the Tamil la pa poru la pa we put bottom na. It is the bottom crack. Pa we put the bottom na top crack. Okay. Wow. Unnu gla unnu studs. Adi kapra in thatla. In unnu shagran bracing ma roko. Bridging or blocking to provide stability. On top of it, we will put some external sheathing. Why yeah, sheathing? Because now, after that, only it provides uh, external protection against the environment. So you have to put a sheathing. Sheathing is nothing but some thick board. It can be a plywood. It can be a gypsum board. It can be a particle cement board. It can be a fiber cement board or whatever it is. Several different types of uh, boards are available in the market. You put it on the front and you put it on the back. Right? This is how it is. So the problem, the good thing is, these boards also provide strength and stiffness. So far, the contribution of the boards to the strength and stiffness have been ignored. Now we did research to see whether that strength and stiffness that you are anyway going to put as a board can be taken into consideration. Hence, I can reduce some of these internal bracings and put only the columns start and then put these bracings and use it, such that I can reduce the cost. Because this is going for Prime Minister's Avas Yojana, where they will give two lakh rupees or something like that. Can the poor Indian citizen, the the the, the person who is in the lowest totem pole, can he get benefited by using this research? Hence, he does not have to borrow money at an exorbitant rate. If you buy a concrete house, they will give two lakh, and then he has to buy you know borrow it for three or four lakhs, six lakhs is the cost of the construction, and the rest of his life he will become a financial slave to someone because he has to pay the rent. All these things, and he will be a poor fellow dying. Okay, can we avoid that and make sure that we you take the money from the government, give a sustainable house to him, so that he does not have to borrow money. So, in the process of doing so, can we reduce the consumption of steel? How can we can reduce the consumption by reducing these internal members? But anyway, we are going to put the sheet in the top. This was the <coughs> goal for it. So, but we also have to understand how they take the load, right? That is also important. When we put the sheet in, what happens is that. The failure, there is a immediate change in the failure mode when we put the sheathing. Okay, this is a core form steel that is unbuckled, which means that the load has not taken place yet. The next one is a minor axis buckling. When you apply the load, if the, if the IY is low, then it goes through what is minor axis buckling. The next one is what is known as flexural torsional buckling, FT. Right? Singly symmetric cross sections undergo flexural torsional buckling. What is flexural torsional buckling? When the shear center and the centroid does not coincide, then you call it as flexural torsional buckling. By the way, what is shear center? What do you, you know? What is shear center? The two cup pass. What is centroid? You do that mathematical calculations and find out the mass of this. Okay. That is the centroid, right? Y bar, AX bar, you know, all these things. That is the centroid. That centroid gives you something, okay? But there is something called shear center. Shear center is a magical point in the cross section. When you apply the load through that point, what you get is bending either in x direction or in y direction, but certainly not torsion. So twisting can be avoided when you apply the load through the Shear center. When the shear center and the centroid coincides, you don't have any kind of problem with torsion. That is why I sections, although it is egoistic, is predominant. You now, what egoistic is? I am saying I sections, and hence it is egoistic. That's a pun. Okay. So it's predominantly used as a default cross section for one simple reason: because the shear center and the centroid coincides. Which is not the case for cold form steel because cold form steel by default actually is bent into a C shape, which is the easiest form to be carried out in a press break. 
you know what a press break is, you, you know, you have something, it will come and it will make it bend. And then you push it and then you put it, press the button, it will come and bend. So by piece by piece, you make it, that's called a press break. You can Google it, you'll get pictures and things like that. Okay, so that is why it is a C-shaped cross-section. When you have a C-shaped cross-section, what happens is that it is bound to have flexural torsional buckling. In addition to flexing, it also twists because the load is not being applied to the shear center. Then you have what is known as a distortional buckling. There is another term called distortional buckling. Distortional buckling is a term very specific for pole form steel. Okay, it is something between local buckling and global buckling, the in between, trisanko, right? That is your distortional buckling. Then you have interaction. These are all isolated buckling. Local, global, distortional, all isolated. Then you have interaction, which is global distortional interaction. Okay, global distortional local interaction. I can go on and talk about this little bit, but I can sense you, you'll run out of this <laughs> office, so I will stop here. But only one key thing I want to tell you, if you want to know if it is locally bucking, you only observe the web. If the web is coming down, going up, coming down, going up, coming down, going up, that clearly indicates that is a local bucking. Okay. If the flanges are closing and opening, closing and opening, closing and opening, which is happening here, as well as here, right? Closing here, opening here, closing here, opening here, right? That is your distortion bucking. So if you want to see the mode shape, that gives you a good indication. So this has both local, okay, and the distortional, and the global, it also bends here, slightly bends here, it's not straight, that is going to be your global, local, distortional bucket. All these are bad fellows, extremely bad fellows, because they take away your load, okay, in isolation, without a sheathing board. But the moment you see, they put a sheathing board, their failure mode dramatically changes, so you will have the sheathed one, so column with the sheathed parameters, which the screws that we attach can be taken as some kind of a support. Okay. And this will ensure that the column will fail in minor axis buckling, but now it is not for the entire length, but the length is between two times your spacing between the screws. Why two times the spacing between the screws will be told in the next step. But if you are very interested to know, I will tell you that. Because screws are something that you need to have a carefully skilled worker to put the screws. If you don't have a skilled worker, okay. Gone are the days where a mason's son is a mason, that son is that. You know. Today, everybody can become whatever they want, right. So, it's also good in a way. But in, in an other parts of the nation where today he is out of Allah, tomorrow if he gets a job as a construction site worker, he will go. How much training can you give? You cannot give. He will put some screws deep inside, some screws. So you cannot rely on the quality of the screws that he is putting. So what the code says is that, let's assume 50% of the screws that he put is useless. Okay. Then what we do is that we take only the screws two times the depth. So we take one intermediate screw out and that is why you get two D.